And as far as the session is concerned, let me also add my thanks and commend ICRIAR and Ambassador HK and Sanjay for putting this together. And I heard a brief reference when Jagannath Panda in his remarks spoke about what we did in 2005, which at that, when I say we, I mean the IDSA at that time. And it was 60 years after the war. It's a very interesting title, by the way, after the war. I thought both the and war were very, very pregnant with import. So 60 years, I mean, we did 2005, which was 60 years after the Great War of 1945. And it struck me when I was making my notes that we had a similar kind of interaction in 95. And this was 50 years after the war. And this was Tokyo. And I remember Ambassador Matsunaga, some in the audience, maybe my Japanese colleague here would remember, this was six years after Tiananmen. And it was also a period when we were talking about the Japan that can say no, the Ishihara debate. And a very nascent, new, bubbly US President Bill Clinton sort of making a pitch in the international arena that it was really Pacific Pacific and it was East Asia and, you know, all kinds of formulations. And it just, you know, when I was looking back, I said, how much things change and yet remain the same within a decade? So from 95, 50 years after the war, to 2005, 60 years after the war, to now, 2015, 70 years after the war, you know, we see both the continuity and the change. And I thought this context is very, very instructive in many ways. You talk about the war itself, you know, it is really, I think, the techno-strategic moment, the Hiroshima-Nagasaki experience. And how that transmutes, if you will, the texture of the global order. And we are part of that dynamic, that this texture is continuously changing. And a brief sort of recall saying that what are the big punctuations of the last 70 years that merit the collective attention of a group like this? I mean, off the top of my head, I would say that after 45 and Hiroshima, we went through that anomalous 46 years of the Cold War. So the end of the Cold War, the very unexpected and distinctive, perhaps sui generis end of the Cold War in December 1991, when you have the implosion of the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union now, and maybe, you know, in the same scale, I'd very tentatively suggest, though I don't think it is a congruent kind of example, but there is a correspondence, when we talk about the 9-11 moment and what 9-11 does again to the fabric and texture of this global systemic. And it's in this backdrop, you know, that we are looking at or trying to understand the maritime dynamic, accepting the tenet that maritime security or the maritime compulsion is only a subset of a much larger and more complex kind of holistic strategic orientation as far as the global order is concerned. You know, the Asia Pacific then becomes a part of that larger construct. And again, this is an issue that we have discussed many times over the last few months, and I have been grappling with this saying, how do we characterize the maritime domain? What is the most, what's the comfort level, you know, to try and grapple or come to grips with the maritime domain? And there are various ways of doing this. One is to just look at this spatially and say that if you look at the map, it's a fairly easy point of departure. We have three navigable oceans, the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Indian. We have the two poles. That's one way of looking at the maritime domain, and then cut to the Asia Pacific. Or should we look at this thematically? And let me take the liberty of now recognizing Ms. Cleo Pascal. Some of you know her and her work. She has been advancing the argument of, or the formulation of the three Gs, the geopolitical, the geoeconomic, and the geophysical. So that's one way of triangulating the maritime domain. Or, you know, for the IR scholar, maybe if we just look at the principal interlocutors, who are the big boys, who are the principal players who bring both capacity and intent to the maritime domain. It was fairly binary in the Cold War. We spoke about the United States and the Western Alliance and the former USSR and whatever cluster that had naval capacity at that time in the Eastern Bloc. I would suggest that maybe we should take a bit of everything, meaning look at this spatially, look at this temporally, 
look at this thematically and also see the relevance of the principal players. They may not all necessarily have the same capacity and maybe make the following broad observation that if you look at the long cycle of the last 70 years, seven decades, clearly I think the last two sessions already identified the shift, the geopolitical shift, the geoeconomic shift, and I think Naidu's session had all kinds of figures about how many billions of dollars, et cetera, et cetera. The extension is that the maritime domain, the global focus has clearly shifted from the Cold War, which was the equivalent of the Atlantic Pacific. And as I said, in that brief Clinton period, it seemed it was becoming Pacific Pacific, which was not true. And definitely now after 9-11, the rise of China, the rise of East Asia and the great geoeconomic shift, we are looking at the equivalent of the Pacific Indian Ocean continuum, which for want of a better phrase has now been termed also as the Indo-Pacific. And perhaps that is one way of looking at the current level of animation. Concurrently to suggest that if you look at the next decade, you know, at some point there would be 80 years after the war when we come to 2025, you see the emergence of what you might call as an uneasy strategic triangle. And this uneasy strategic triangle is China, which is likely to be the world's number one GDP around 2025 as we speak, give and take a few years. The United States is a close second, and India as a distant third, all things being equal. And the anomaly is that for the first time, at least in the last 100 years, 150 years, you will have an anomalous situation where the number one GDP, which in this case is China, will not necessarily be the, will not necessarily be the number one military power. And that in turn is going to lead to what you might call a certain degree of strategic lack of appropriate equilibrium. And again, one way of triangulating and suggesting is that the maritime domain is likely to be a very, very relevant and significant domain in terms of how the interactions are going to play out. And to extend Cleo's formulation, if we look at this purely in terms of geopolitics, which subsumes the strategic and security dynamic, clearly we are seeing the contestation even as we speak. At the current ASEAN summit, the American position, the Chinese position, what will now, I think, telescope into the EAS as and when the final document comes out, you will see contestation, which I think the policymakers are all hoping that it would not lead to any kind of military confrontation. So it calls for a certain degree of dexterity and political astuteness not to push beyond a certain point as far as the strategic and the security domain is concerned. While Concurrently, I think the economic and trade compulsion is also as critical and perhaps even more immediate. We've already had reference to TPP, the OROB, the FTA, so on and so forth, where the principle or the concept at play is that there is intense competition. And given the fact that the state itself is not the primary player in matters of economic trade and fiscal initiatives, one hopes that this competition will remain healthy against the holy grail of an equitable economic order. Now that is a receding kind of objective for a variety of reasons, but as I said, I characterize economic trade in that manner. And finally draw attention to the geophysical, which in every forum that we've been speaking, we try to sort of make, uh, draw attention to this, that this is a very critical kind of area which is not receiving adequate attention. And its most dramatic manifestation is if there is increasing global warming and the level of the oceans and the seas increases, the Maldives will disappear. I mean, I'm just putting it as dramatically as I can to make the point. Or more recently, I had attended a conference which was about the pollution of the oceans. It was done by the scientists and the oceanographers. It is frightening. I'll just give you again this illustratively. They spoke about an island, a continent of plastic which is about half the size of Australia. If anyone, any of you can imagine the size of Australia and a floating continent of plastic, which is you know, fragmenting and coalescing again. That's only one pollutant. Here, one can make a case for very robust cooperation across the board. Bring what you have to the table because I think we do not know the scale of the problem. And when we look at the Asia Pacific now, against this backdrop and say, what is the maritime security 
issue? How is it being animated? I think this would provide perhaps a useful framework. And I sort of thought I'd put this on the table because uh, Dr. Pankaj Jha is not able to join us. And I was asked to sort of make some opening remarks that would place the issue in a larger contextual framework. And I thought this could be a point of departure. You don't have to agree with this, by the way. But to walk us through, and keeping within the time limits that we have, we have two very eminent speakers. If you see their CVs, perhaps one way of describing or introducing them is that they are both very good fellows, one of the IDSA and one of the ORF. And they are also very diligent fellows. I have seen both their work, you know, at fairly